glad we're here, right? Like the old saying says, better late than never. All right. Gotta get that to stay. Okay. Let's take our Bibles and go to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33. I appreciate everybody's dedication to the house of the Lord tonight. I know that the Lord is pleased that we're here together. That's, it's always good. It's good to be here, but it's best when we're together. Uh, and, you know, before, before, you know, before all the COVID stuff uh, was going around, uh, that would have been a very strange statement to say. <laughs> Uh, but knowing that I've literally been here by myself, looking at totally an empty auditorium, <laughs> I can honestly say not only is it good to be here, but it's best when we're together. So I like, I like that. All right, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33, and we're going to begin reading down in verse 26 of chapter 33. There is none like unto God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency, and thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Tonight I want to preach uh, a message with the Lord's help on the eternal God is thy refuge. We should never forget that. And if ever we were, there was a time when we were looking to kind of hide a little bit in certain instances, this day and age would be a great place to hide. It really would. With all the things that are going on in the world, all the, all the, all the violence and the wars and the hate and the, uh, everybody just at each other and nobody caring seemingly enough uh, about one another, it would be a perfectly logical place, but you realize that now you can't stay hidden. It's not God's will that we stay hidden, but it is, uh, there, is there are times when we need to hide. And, and, we need to, and we need a refuge, and the Lord, our God, is our refuge that we can go back to. So uh, it's really a, a wonderful thing, a great peace and comfort to the child of God to know they have a refuge uh, and that refuge is God. So let's bow our heads and we'll ask the Lord's blessings over the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for giving us safe uh, safety here to the house of the Lord. I uh, thank you for each and every one who is here, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would bless our time together May it be a time that's profitable. I uh, pray, Father, that you'd help us tonight. I pray you'd bless us tonight and also keep us safe uh, later on as we travel to our, to our homes and uh, residences, Lord. I uh, pray, Father, for, for those that may even still be on their way. It's snowing pretty hard out there. Pray you just give p a safety on the roads. Uh, I bless our time together now in the Word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this, in this area here, the years of wandering are now over for Israel. Once again, they're standing on the, the, the threshold of the land flowing with milk and honey. Forty years is a really long time. The Israelites have no doubt gotten comfortable 
with their fate. A lot of them probably just figured you're just going to lead us around the wilderness and we're going to die. Now they did take notice that people did die in the wilderness. They did die and God caused them to die. And in most cases where you find the murmuring and griping and complaining and, and, and you know what they said, God said, you're not going to see this land I've promised. And, and, and those, those, that generation fell in the wilderness. And they never got to see that promised land. But the rest of them have no doubt gotten comfortable with that. God's cared for every need that they had. They had faced little adversity from enemies this whole time. Their biggest thing was, we don't have food, we don't have water. And, you know, what did you bring us out here to die for? Uh, that they just just complaining and complaining. Moses had been uh, pretty staunch in leadership and uh, little had been required of them. Moses pretty much took care of a lot of things for them. Now, he, he de dealt directly with God and eventually, as a matter of fact, we see in the Bible where Moses took on too much. And his father-in-law saw this, this and he's like, listen, you need to find some righteous guys, some righteous men, and, and divide up the work. Let them squabble over the little matters and bring the big matters to you. This will lighten your load. It'll bring a lot of less stress on you. And, and, and so Moses did this and it ended up working out really, really well. But up until that point, he had pretty much been the guy saying, I'm it. And everything, and now think about this, it's hard enough to deal with a few complaints. Imagine three million plus people complaining at you, bringing their complaints to you. Uh, that would be very, very discouraging at best uh, to have to deal with all this. And, and especially, you know, when you're, you know, by that time, you, I mean, you, he may just as well have been there all day just trying to just hear people's complaints. Uh, and, and so Moses dealt a lot of direct with that, but he'd been pretty, pretty straightforward and staunch in the leadership. Now, a generation's passed away who doubted God in the presence of the land. Some of them doubted God right there at the very door, very doorstep of Canaan. Okay, and so uh, with all its seeming impossibilities, remember, 10 came back and said, nope, we can't do it. And two came back and said, yep, we can. Right? The 10 to 2 ratio. That's generally how it goes. Uh, mostly because they don't, wanna, they don't want to work for what God has put forth. God has already given them victory. He already said, all you have to do is go and possess the land. Go take it. I've already given it to you. They're no strangers to that. All they had to do is go. Now, God has got things spoken in our lives. He's got things set, and he says, I've already won the victory for you, but that doesn't mean you sit on the sideline because he tells you he's already won the victory. You still have to go through that motion. You still have to go through that battle. You still have to go forward, and God has already given you the victory, but you still have to do something to get it, right? We don't just get victory we, we go through it. Now, we were promised victory, we're given victory, but we still have to go and fight. We still have to go take possession of what God has given us, right? I mean, if I had, okay, here's a good example. I have a Kleenex box, and I have one, and all you have to do is just come get it. Now, you could sit there and say, he's already got me a Kleenex box. But does that get you the Kleenex box? Even though I promised it to you? No, I still have it. It's not until someone gets up and comes forward and takes the possession. Come possess what I have for you. That is what God is trying to teach them. That's what God is trying to show them. Don't you love these little fun things? I love those little fun things. Those are great. They say, oh, well, that, yeah, you know what? That makes sense. God said, I have this land here, but you have to possess it. You have to come and take it and just occupy, right? So they, they, they kind of had the wrong uh, thoughts of that. They saw the giants. They saw uh, all these different things. 
You know, maybe, who knows what went through their mind, but 10 of those guys, spies, came back and said, we can't. Now, Israel faces a twofold dilemma as they approach the land. They're going to now face giants greater and taller than we, that was reported, as well as cities walled up to heaven. The giants are no smaller, and they probably have heard many stories about them uh, throughout the years by those who turn back in discouragement. Walled cities loom as opposing uh, the skyline as ever, seemingly impregnable. You know, we, we see like that, you, th you look at great wonders like the Great Wall of China. Tell me the rest of the world doesn't care about walls around, around them. They do. For miles, we have walls. But, you know, not us, because, you know, we don't, need, we don't need walls. Anyway, walls are, you know, useless. Uh, walls are pretty much useless. Anyway, we, we, we see that, that, that all these walls, they just seem to be insurmountable. Like how in the world are we ever going to get in there? How are we ever going to do this? But God has got the plan, okay? So, uh, and, and Moses is not going to lead the people into Canaan land. We find that. I'm not going to go there for sake of time. But he's, we're not going to go there, but if, you're, if you want the reference, it's uh, chapter 34, verses 7 through 10. Now, God says, you're not going to go over. We all know why. And, and God loved Moses to death right there on the mountain and, and buried him. But now he's to be replaced by Joshua. Though Joshua's a great man in the eyes of the people, he's still not Moses. They were hung on, this is Moses we're talking about here. This was a big deal. Moses was a big deal. And so now we find Joshua, although he was there, he was faithful, and he, and he worked, and he, and he brought forth a good, uh, good prospect. Now we see uh, that, that it's coming to his. The command is now coming to him, and God gives him that same wonderful uh, statement that says, as I was with Moses, so also shall I be with thee, which is awesome because it, does, it doesn't mean that God's just going to hang out with what we would call the big wigs, right? God doesn't just promise to be there for the, 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 the Tom Malones and the R.B. Willettes and the, all, the great, all the great preachers all around. God can be with somebody like me, who not too many people know, and that's okay. Sometimes it's better that they don't know, because then that would be less phone calls that I'll get, amen? But see, God says, I will be with you just like I was with them. A person that's surrendering to God, God will use anybody that will yield themselves, even a little boy who offered a lunch is recorded forever in scripture i i think that's so awesome little did that kid know when he brought his lunch to jesus that day that he would be immortalized forever in the word of god and a, as an example of what we can give to god even though it isn't much what is that that's that's most of our cause right i don't have much but what I do have, I'm just going to offer it to you, Lord. You take it and you do whatever you want with it. Because it's not going to be enough by itself to, to, to meet the need. And that's why we do things together. That's why God said to, to divide up, to pray and gather together. Because, you know what? My little bit, your little bit, your little bit, and everybody else's little bit adds up to a whole lot. By the end of it. All right. And then that is how we can help people together. That's how we can do it. It's not my little bit. And that's what's the problem in a lot of churches is that everybody or most everybody. Right. Because we all know the, the statistics show that there's probably 10 percent or less that keep a church running. And the rest just are there just to be there. Now, what would happen if that was opposite, that we have 90% of people doing something for God and only 10%? That's how it should be. Those figures should be reversed. Yeah. 
in a church because many hands make light work. And if the work's not light, then that means that there's too much, uh, depending on what little bit might be up here in the pulpit, what little bit might be out there in the pew. Okay, we can't just look and say, oh, it's just the preacher's job or just the deacon's job or it's this one's job or that one's job. It's all of our jobs. That command was in the word of God to every single person. Every single saved person is required to do this. We're commanded to do this. And so if we all take what we can give and we throw it in the pile and we have a joint effort together, we can really do something. That's how things get done. It's not just, well, well, you know, we, we just throw it all together. And so, uh, you know, this uh, awesome prospect that must have been. Here in these verses, Moses is speaking his last to the people as he prepares to be gathered unto his people, as God had told him that he's going to be. All right, as it was 40 years ago, victory was assured, God promised. Moses assured the people he was able to deliver the land with its inhabitants into Israel's hand. He's, he's reiterating these things, okay? Moses instilled confidence to Israel by placing their confidence in Jehovah. And that's what any good leader of a church is going to do, is going to see, I don't want your confidence in me. Yes, you can be confident in me. Yes, there are, there's a lot you can be confident in me with. But my job is to get your confidence built up by putting your confidence in him. By me telling you that you and I need our confidence in him. Not in man, not in the building, not in anything else, not in prospects, not in uh, anything else at all. But that we should put our confidence in him, therefore we're never going to be let down. We're never going to fail because of that. We're, we're going to have what we need because we placed our confidence in the Lord God. What a wonderful thing, the knowledge of just who God is is i'm glad that god, the god of israel is my god in these days we fight we fight giants who inhabit cities walled up to heaven yet the promises to israel are also the promises to us we're all a part of it we're grafted in okay so i want you to see a few things uh, as we have time tonight i want you to see first of all that our god is one of a kind. He is one of a kind. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. Listen, there is nobody like him. Nobody uh, can, can even come close. Nobody can. There's not going to be any after him. There's nobody before him, and there's nobody that can, that can, that can equal him at all. There's none like him. There's none like him in power because all power in heaven and earth is his. Any power that exists was given by God in the first place. Okay? And so what God... Uh, it's no jobs too hard, no enemy too tough, and no task too impossible. There's also none like him in his performance... What God does is done right. It's always done right. It's done the right way. And what God does brings a right result because it's done right. Something that's done right will bring a good result. If it's not done right, it's not going to bring forth the right result. And that's what we need to, that's what we need to see here. In this, there's also none like him in his perpetuality. He is the eternal and unchanging God. He, it's never ending. He is the one who spans eternity. He goes from before anything ever was to after all things. It's, he's, he always was, he always is, and he always will be. And he, there's, that's why I said he's, he, it just, it's perpetual. It doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. He always there. He never goes to sleep. He doesn't take a break. Man, would we be crying? We'd be crying 
What do you mean? I don't get a nap? I don't get a rest? Well, God doesn't. Right? And he allows us to have good things like that. And, you know, I, you often wonder sometimes what God did on his day of rest. Have you ever wondered, like, what activity he did? He just hung out or, uh, you know, just took a look and watched everything as it was going. You know, I, I, I want to know, know a lot of that. You know, that, that's some of the cool things that isn't always spelled out. Now, we know he took the rest. We know he did it for an example to us to take a day of rest, to be able to sanctify it, to make it holy, to set it apart, to make it a day of importance. The Lord's day is always supposed to be a day of importance. Always. There's never a time the Lord's day should not be an important. It is an important day. We are to sanctify it. We are to make it holy. It should be worth more to us. But, you know, he doesn't take vacations or time off. He, he's always, he's always going to be there. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. He's right there all the time. I thank God for that. Secondly, our God is active in our help, and you can say amen right there. Man, what a friend. What a faithful friend always there, and he is our help. Others may want to help and even try to help, but the Lord is our it's one thing in helping and, and, and trying to help something or trying to help uh, a situation, but it's another to be that help. And the Lord has used many people in this room to be his help. I find that to be an incredible honor that, that we could be used of God to be the help that he provides people. I think that is an amazing, amazing thing. And it's, it, it's worthy uh, of mentioning because of that. His help is promised. He's always promised it. Our help cometh from the Lord. Vain is the help of man and horses or princes. The arm of flesh is going to fail us. The Lord is our confidence. He, his help is present. Man, I like that too. He's a very present help in the time of need. Very present and always on time. Never early, never late, just there. Comes through when it's supposed to come through. His help is purpose. He does not give us what we oft, often what we want when we want it. Like I said, he's above time, and the, we're, when his time lines up with our time, that's the perfect time. Everything, God is right, very precise. He's very specific and very, very much precise. So it lands when it's supposed to land because that's when God intended it to land. Okay, so we don't need to get discouraged when you're asking and you don't get right away. We have to wait for the fullness of time on everything. And so uh, that, that's why his, his help is present. Uh, God is our refuge in the time of trouble. Uh, we find that in verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Wow, I love that. I really love that. I mean, he's the refuge, and underneath that refuge are everlasting arms to, to gather, to hold, to, to, to comfort, all of those things. The Lord's more than just a place to run to. He is a place of abode. Hid with Christ and God is more theology that I can explain. It's, it's a place of permanent resonance in the beloved. It's a permanent dwelling. Dwelling in the Lord. Uh, that, we're, that we're a part of that. We're in that. <clears throat> he is a covert in the storm. When the wind, whirlwind comes, when the clouds Swirl about us, the wind blows, we can stand secure because he's there. He's there to in, in, in case us. He's a castle in the battle when the enemy approaches, when enemy comes like a flood. 
The Spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against him. He's a comfort in the night when sorrows like sea billows roll. In the night of deep despair, my faith keeps telling me he is there. I like that. Fourthly, our God is able to keep us from falling. We cannot fall so deep into distress or so low in affliction that the grace of an ever-faithful God will not still encircle us. See, in verse 27, the eternal God is thy refuge underneath are the everlasting arms. And he and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. Hey, he's telling you that. Did you catch that? He's going to thrust out the enemy from before you and say, destroy them. So sometimes when you feel like the enemy's all up on you, God is going to take them, shove them back, and say, go get them. Charge forward, go. And you'll have victory. You'll have victory in that battle. Because it was God that pushed them back. It was God who went before you with his hand that you might go forward into, that, into the fray and win. And come out undefeated. He's able to keep us from, that, from, from falling. See, our foundation is secure. Our feet are on the, solid, on the rock of ages. God himself is our sole support. It's upon him that we stand firm. I'm standing on the rock of ages, safe from every storm that rages. I'm there. I am standing firm, and I am there. And it doesn't matter. If you're built on the rock, that rain can beat on that house. It's not happening. It's not going anywhere. It's on the rock. You build your house on the sand and you're going down in the storm. Where the house on the rock will take every storm after storm after storm after storm. Every single one of them. Because there's never just one. There's always multiple. They, they just kind of keep coming. But you know what? What God has made us. And see... If we even took ourselves in a, an illustrative kind of way, took ourselves, pictured ourselves as the house, right? Now, what kind of materials do you build your house with? You know, there's the, there's the ones that go when they build a house and they go cheapy, cheapy, right? Uh, it's all just aftermarket stuff and thinner stuff and plastics. I mean, look at what they do to our cars, right? That, that's what, they, you used to be able to drive through a wall and maybe have to buff out the bumper. Now you get, you get hit by a shopping cart and you're, you're totaling your car. Because it's all fiberglass, plastic, but yet they're charging way more now for cars than they used to. I remember my dad telling me we paid $3,000, I think, for the, wasn't it three grand for the first car you ever bought? Or... Was that just brand new ones that were on the showroom floor for three thousand back then? Okay, brand new Buick, right? Back in the seventies, right? I'm assuming somewhere in there. Ballpark. Now, cars back then they were all metal, heavy. You know, you they didn't have much trouble in the snow because they were built like tanks. Right? So all that metal, and they charge that less. And now you get fiberglass, plastic, chipped out stuff, and now it's $60,000 for a truck. Excuse me. Say what, Ford? You want $60,000. This thing better be a camper as well. And I know you got a, a, an eight-foot bed that never has to be made, but I'm just saying that, that it's not worth, it's not nowhere worth that. Because in four years, five years, and that stuff starts going, and then you think, okay, not only are you paying all this money, then your insurance is going to be way high because you're paying on such a huge thing, and then you start, the chip stuff starts failing, 
And then you realize, oh my, that's why it's so expensive. And then not only that, it's like, okay, if it's going to be 60000 then you ought to guarantee 10 years of replacing anything that goes wrong in that truck. That's what you ought to do. Because any good car ought to last you 10 years. Right? And if you've got this big high-tech thing that's probably got some kind of a satellite comm link in it, and you're paying 60000 it's a house. In some respects, that might be a couple houses. Right? That's not, that is not worth it. People don't understand. They just don't understand. But your value, but think about what you would want to build your house with. Now, we're, we know that we have a foundation laid. That's in Christ Jesus. That's, he is that foundation. No other foundation can any man lay but that which is laid is Jesus Christ. Okay? We're building our house. We build our house on the rock, on that foundation, on that rock. But you know what? There's things that you can put on the outside of that house that help. Gutters. <laughs> gutters are good. We like gutters, except when we have to clean them out. And now they even have this leaf guard thing where you only get like this little tiny hole that's there. And I don't know how all that works. They probably want 60 grand for that too. Ridiculous. But we need to build on ourselves. The Bible tells us to build on that foundation because it says take heed how you build thereon. We build our own house to withstand whatever storms are coming. We take that which from the word of God and we add it to our spiritual house so that when that comes in and wave after wave after wave and storm after storm comes, we're not getting all beat up because we have built a good house on a firm foundation. Okay, so it's, we got we to gotta keep to that. So, uh, our steps are also sure. Our goings have been forever established. Our path shines brighter as darkness of this world deepens. The world is, uh, the word is our lamp and our light as our spirit is our guide. Our way is also straight. He girds us and undergirds us. We may fail, but we will never fall. That's what I like, because even though the refuge is up here, underneath are the everlasting arms. So when you're in the refuge, and then all of a sudden, oh, gotcha. Okay, that's what he's there for. He'll catch us. Our God will defeat, fifthly, our God will defeat our enemies. We saw that again in verse 27. It does me well to remember that the battle is the Lord's, and he cannot be defeated. Our God is going to stand and uh, he will stand and he uh, with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He's going to fight for us. So if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? The Bible says. There are no giants too tall for God. There's no walled cities too high for God. There are no devils too powerful for God. Our God assures us of a victory. And we see that in verse 29, which we read. Okay, he's going to be the shield and the sword, and thine enemies will be fine liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. We've already been given the victory there. All right, God's going to expose them, and God will enthrone thee. Lastly, our, our God will keep us both safe and secure. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is is of the Lord. The Bible tells us we're kept safe spiritually because he gives us eternal life. When we say everlasting life, which is what Jesus said, that's what it means. It means that life that is everlasting, which is eternal life. People get so hung up because you use the word eternal. Well, he's an eternal God who's given you an eternal life. That will be as long as his from there on out. Days without number. Joys without end. In the presence of God. 
will be kept, will be kept safe spiritually, and we're kept safe physically too. Psalms 4, 8 says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, O Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. So as I'm concluding here, as we, the saved people of, uh, that are saved by the Lord, he is the shield of your help. He's the sword of thy excellency. He said, thine enemies shall be found liars. Thou shalt tread upon their high places. And what a wonderful God we have. What a wonderful God we serve. That he would dedicate all that time and effort into you and I who really don't deserve that. But see, God is going to do like any, any, any one of us would want to do or should want to do is protect your investment. God has invested everything in you. Think about it. Given you his son, his son's blood, all of heaven becoming joint heirs with Jesus Christ, giving you uh, not only the sonship, but also that spirit of adoption where you're, doubly, you're double covered and you're there, and he's given you security, he's given you help, he's given us blessings, and he's given us all the things. We could be here the rest of the year and never touch all that God has invested in us. Think about that. Now, what do you think God would be so haphazard as to give everything the heaven's best has and invest it in you and just let you go on your way and not care? That is the most foolish thing anyone could ever think. Right outside of there is no God, the fool had said in his heart there is no God, well, you could just write a little addendum under that, that the second most foolish thing you could do and think is that God would invest all he has in you and just leave you to your own, own devices and not protect his investment. Because he will. And he is. He knows all of our needs, and he makes sure that they're met. I love that. And we ought to be thankful tonight. I'm so very thankful that God invested in me. I'm glad that he chose to save me and redeem me and uh, that he's given me all that he has. And, I, you know, there are so many times I, I think, man, you really got the, the bad end of the deal, Lord. I don't have any of that to give. And all you want is the best that I can give. And you want to, and see, our best really isn't good enough, and we know that. But see, you know the, the, the cool thing about God is he knows how to up our best and make our best better. God does that. Through his word and our response to the word of God, he takes what that little junky best that we have, and he increases it and makes it. Just like he, he, he never calls the qualified, but he qualifies everybody he calls. He makes our best better. It makes it his better. <laughs> God does that. And God wants to continue to bring us up and bring our level of what we can give to a better rate and to a higher rate that's better, more pleasing to him, the more we submit ourselves to the word of God. So we need to understand it. We need to just, just get on board with getting our best promoted because it needs it. Our best is not, if our righteousness is our filthy rags, what do you think our efforts are? <laughs> I think about that one, but not for too long. I don't want nobody depressed. <laughs> Let's come for the invitation.